joining us right now, the man behind the camera, the president of the Christian Action Network, the author of the book, Latin America, the untold story of Islamic training camps in America. The lawyer shows us right now. He's taking place right there. He's taking place right there. He's taking place right there. It's an isolated community as most of these communities are located in rural areas, very good and mountainous areas. And what we wanted to do was challenge them to open up this invitation to actually come out to these compounds to see what the is all about. So we brought our candidates, we tried to get on, and this is how we got treated. And clearly, this is the whole thing that we're seeing here. What goes on in these campuses? What people say, hey, there are Jewish camps in this country, Christian camps in this country. Country, why can't we have a Muslim? Because these are truly neighborhood zones, and like the ones in Europe, which have this stuff, you can actually walk into those neighborhood zones. You can walk out with your cameras, you can talk to people. But in these particular neighborhood zones, you can't walk out into them. They have gates, they have armed guards, they have security forces. And when you go up into them, you are specifically told to leave these particular areas. And they're particularly dangerous. And we're watching right now. Where are we taking a look see this place? Uh, this is a video they put out for the people inside of the compounds so that they learn how to do terrorist type training. They teach them how to kidnap people, how to strangle them, how to kill guards, how to do guerrilla type warfare training. Uh, and this is what goes on in these isolated no-go zones inside the United States. In America, name some states, name some areas, because you also said they're affiliated with a Pakistani militant group. Yeah, that Pakistani military group is called Jamal al Fruka, run by Sheikh Jalani, who most people haven't heard of, but that is the guy that Daniel Pearl, Wall Street Journal, was hoping to interview and was arranging to interview when he was kidnapped and then later beheaded. So name some towns, name some cities, name some states. Well, we have them in Texas, Sweeney, Texas. We have them in New York, South Carolina. We have them in Commerce, uh, Georgia. We have them in Red House, Virginia. We have them in upstate New York. We have them in California. We have them in Michigan. Uh, they're scattered all around the United States. So right now, when you call an officer and say, hey, wait a second, you had an enclave here, this is Islamic extremists being trained on our ground. What is the law enforcement reaction? Well, the interesting thing about these camps, they're located in very rural areas of America, which has very small police departments, and they intentionally set them up in these areas where, for instance, the one in New York, they have a total of four police officers. I want you to hear what you say is a recruitment. They sent a, a recruitment video to fill up these camps. Listen. <laughs> Where'd you get that? Well, actually, it took about four years to actually locate that video. We knew it existed, and we had someone inside of the law uh, enforcement department out of Colorado who snuck us the tape, and finally we were able to make it public. FBI's reaction? FBI's reaction is, is that, look, you know, they have the First Amendment and other American rights to operate these enclaves in the United States, regardless of the type of weapon training, rural warfare training that's going on inside of it. It's not okay with me, and it certainly doesn't seem to be okay with you. Martin Moyer, thanks so much, President CEO of the Christian Action Network. Thank, Thank you for letting me be here. And we'll keep looking at this. More. Anger tonight for Muslims in Irving. This after the city just approved a resolution that they say is aimed at persecuting their religion. Jeff Paul on the story, joining us live tonight, where Irving's mayor is defending this vote that went down. Jeff? Well, Doug, tempers flared here inside City Hall in Irving as council members voted and approved on this resolution right here in support of a House bill that forbids any use of any foreign law. Now, it was a more symbolic vote, but many Muslims who were inside tonight say they feel like they're being targeted and that it further solidifies Islamophobia. Please, Bob. In five seconds, the Irving City Council physically will change nothing. And that motion passes watch for. But mentally, for the dozens of Muslims who packed inside City Hall, they say it crushes them. I think it is the most disgraceful day as a citizen in Irving. What Omar Solomon is talking about is the approved city resolution that supports House Bill 562. The proposed legislation codifies that U.S. and state laws supersede foreign laws. The elephant in the room is that it's the anti-Sharia bill. Many Muslims believe it's in reaction to a new Islamic tribunal that was just created in Irving earlier this year. 
Muslim judges told us in February it was religious mediation for civil disputes like marriage and not binding. This bill does not mention at all Muslim, Sharia law, Islam, even religion. The mayor telling the crowd it's important to recognize the Constitution and unite behind U.S. and Texas laws. Respect them, obey them, embrace them. Muslims like Suleiman say it's that rhetoric that furthers the stigma they say endangers them. All we can do is we can take it to the we can take it to the ballot box. I mean, we, we need to we, we will vote. Now, state lawmakers in support of this House bill say it should get a reading later this month at a state judicial meeting, but it still has a long road before it sees any votes or is passed into law. Reporting live tonight here in Irving, I'm Jeff Paul, CBS 11 News. Our job is to change the Constitution of America. Okay, Scott, put the floodlight on, please. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Dan Ramada. I'm the chapter leader for Cleveland, Ohio, and um, your chapter leader. Thank you so much for coming, all of you. Thank you in advance for your patience this evening. We have a very crowded room, as you can see, a lot going on. And uh, as the night progresses to the point where you're able to purchase Brigitte's books at the end, which will happen in the back room, <clears throat> and then come back in here and see her, get signatures from her. Personal, you know, personalized, um, it'll all work out. Wow, you know, we'll pick up. Let's sell 800 books, well, it, well, it'll all work out. So thank you in advance for your patience. <clears throat> I'll explain those videos shortly. Um, but I thought there's nothing better than hearing in their own words what their intentions are. Uh, so that's why I wanted to start with that, and, uh, and then we'll discuss that shortly. I'd like to introduce you to my partner. Dr. Beverly Goldstein is um, on sabbatical as a chapter leader because she's running for Congress. She's running against Marsha Fudge. Uh, Act for America cannot endorse her because we're a 501c3. However, Dan Ramada personally can endorse her. Okay? It's a no-brainer. Let me remind, remind you of something. When Susan Rice lied to the country about Benghazi and tried to blame it on an obscure YouTube video on five Sunday shows, and she got criticized for it, the first woman who came to her defense was Marsha Fudge. Susan Rice, also the same person who said that Bo Bergdahl served his country with honor and distinction. So, I report, you decide. <laughs> Okay, Bev is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I also want to please, please be seated. I want to welcome all of you here. I know some of you traveled from a very far distance and some of you came from very nearby. We were able to bring this vision that we had for three years. Tonight is our night. So you are here with us and you are making our evening. So bless you all for being here. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so I don't get yelled at by anybody. I'm going to do all the thank yous now. Especially starting with my boss, where is she? Chris? Okay, I want to thank my wife, Chris, for sharing me with the state of Ohio. Um, I told her I was going to do this before years ago. And she's never doubted me, and she said, you know, okay, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? Now the dinner conversation says, where are you going now? That's how that's progressed. Okay, I'd like to thank Jeff, Jeff Badger. Where are you, Jeff? Please stand. Come on, Jeff. Jeff is the owner of the establishment here, and I call the of the States, who has graciously opened his doors for everybody. And uh, when I mentioned this to him last November, he goes, really? Where are we going to put him? <laughs> and I said, I said the same thing to him for the last five months, and he says, don't worry, we got it. We'll figure it out. Okay, so thank you, Jeff. 
And I also want to thank somebody that got us started. Valerie Farkas, where are you? Way in the back. Okay, Valerie, let us have our first initial meetings at her uh, assisted living and nursing home facility down the street on Pleasant Valley and, and Ridge Road. So um, thank you very much, Valerie. That is because we got started in the library with 30 people. Uh, we moved to your place, and then lo and behold, we found our home here. So, um, but it was because of you we got us started, and I can't thank you enough. I would like to thank our team. Everybody in the please in the blue shirt, stand up. This is our Act for America leadership team. And everybody in the As you can see, I'm surrounded by women pretty much, so I get told a lot what to do. <laughs> Thank you for all your help, girls and guys. Thanks to all of you for supporting us and for also for using Eventbrite and reading my emails. And, and I can tell by the feedback that the specific questions I get, people are reading the emails. And you know I don't send out a lot. Meeting announcements, recaps, and action items. And um, so I'm very grateful for the interaction that we have. And I try to answer every single email as I'm told. 1.30 last night in Cincinnati answering emails. When I send out that email about cancellations, if you have tickets, I must have had about 100 cancellations and then 100 people signing back up. So the numbers changed from the other day. So uh, thanks to all of you for making that work. <clears throat> By the way, we use Eventbrite when we have live speakers. Otherwise, we're just using, um, you know, just reply through the email for Skypes and other regular meetings. Okay. Um, like I mentioned, Brigitte will be signing books at the end of the evening. You're going to go through those double doors that you entered. You're going to turn left, go down the hall, and there's a bigger room back there where all the books will be available for purchase, etc. And you'll get the details from uh, one of our ACT leadership people at the end of the meeting on that. So again, patience is what we're asking, and uh, that will be greatly appreciated. When you're going out those doors, by the way, I know there seems to be a lot of confusion these days, especially our elected officials. We have a men's room for men and a ladies' room for ladies. Sometimes I feel like my dad or my mom when they used to say, don't make me come down here. It's really, are we living in a bizarre world or what? Okay, last November we had a regional meeting in Indianapolis. We had dinner with Brigitte, all the chapter leaders, Catherine Rowe from Columbus, Ina, Angela, Charles from Cincinnati, Bev, myself, Chris, we all drove down to Indianapolis, met with other chapter leaders from Indianapolis, or from Indy, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, um, and Ohio. And Brigitte graciously agreed. She says, okay, fine, you guys can do it, uh, put it together, and we'll come out in the spring. And so lo and behold, we're here. It was a lot of hard work to make this happen, and quite frankly, even though I knew I had this place, I wanted this to happen in Cincinnati and Columbus, and I'm overseeing those chapters. So, Ina is a go-getter, as is Catherine. Uh, Ina's in Cincinnati, and Catherine's in Columbus. They're out searching for churches. Regina appears would uh, like to um, speak in churches, a big churches, preferably. Well, we were struggling finding them. So it dawned on me that Brigitte spoke at the Family Research Council Watchman at the Wall Conference last May. And if you've watched those video I sent out repeatedly with the invitation for this, where she, it was like a little teaser about she told that crowd in a four minute video about what she's going to tell you tonight. I called the Family Research Council and said, hey, can I get a list of those pastors? Because I'll just start going right down the list and contact them. And they said, well, we'll do one better. We'll hook you up into the main pastor for the Family Research Council in Ohio. And thank God they did. Because Pastor J.C. Church from Hugh Cyrus came through in a big way. Found the church in Cincinnati, or the church in Cincinnati, the Oasis Church in Middletown, where we were last night, and uh, to a crowd very similar to this. And uh, and then Columbus on Sunday nights. So it's thanks to Pastor J.C. Church for finding that, and I'd like to bring him up right now. He'll lead us in prayer. Thank you, Dan. I just want to, uh, as we prepare to pray, say thank you for taking some time to come uh, and be here tonight and say a big thank you to Dan and his incredible leadership that he's bringing 
to this part of Ohio and, uh, and uh, throughout the entire state of Ohio. Uh, let's, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves and come to you tonight ever thankful for those who have come, those who are here. I ask as we begin this evening that you would touch our eyes that we see something we've never seen. Touch our ears that we hear that which we've never heard. And touch our hearts that we would receive that which we have not received. That this would be a benchmark moment in our life. That we would be moved to action. That we would be moved by your spirit tonight. We ask that you bless Brigitte as she presents, and may we receive what she has to say. We ask for your blessing. Amen. Amen. I uh, work with the Family Research Council, and for the pastors, particularly tonight, we have a table in the, in the, the foyer on the way out. I have a, a CD, a special CD for you. Uh, the eight states that I oversee, we have in, a, in, the, in our Family Research Council family over 10,000 pastors who have stepped up to network to respond to the moral issues and the crisis of the day. Uh, we're championing pastors to engage on a local level and a state level. We have a CD that explains that vision, as well as some important literature pieces, educational pieces, that will be available for those of you who are interested in them. One of them is our cultural impact team uh, brochure, where we're helping pastors raise up people in their churches to engage civically. So when you hear things like this tonight, not just this issue, but the other issues that are near and dear to all of our hearts, we know how to respond. Also, we have a, a brochure, Why Christians Should Seek to Influence Their Government for Good. It is laced with scriptural understanding of how we can engage. And then a wonderful piece by three-star General Jerry Boykin entitled The Threat to Religious Liberties in Our Military. And uh, it's a good educational piece. So we're here to serve and we appreciate ACT and all that they're doing, and we're here to partner with them in the days ahead. And again, thank you, Dan, your leadership, and all of you for being here. God bless you. Okay, so there's a couple of videos. I actually had one more that we didn't get to it because we ran out of time. We're running just a tad late, but uh, <clears throat> the first one about the no-go zones, that was Martin Moyer from the Christian Action Network. Bev and I use a lot of resources to show the, not only just Act for America's information, but we work with, with the Center for Security Policy, the Clarion Project, um, Christian Action Network, any other groups that are uh, in this battle uh, against radicalism. So, I wanted you to see what Martin was talking about on the news, um, on those no-go no, no zones, and also the training camps that are in our uh, country. The other video, a seven-second video, is probably the best video I've found that illustrates the problem. It shows their intentions. Why are they here? That was in 2006 at the Islamic Society of North America annual convention, which they've had like 52 of these things now. That's how long they've been working in our country. And it, clearly, when people hear that that's their intention, is to change our constitution and change it you know, to what? You saw the group down in Texas going to a city council meeting to complain about the city council uh, basically backing the state and trying to get American laws for American courts passed in Texas. That's all that was, a simple city council meeting, and then they went down in Irving, Texas and tried to uh, bully them, basically, into not passing it. You heard what the mayor said. Embrace the Constitution, and they have a problem with it. They're going to go to the ballot box and vote. What are they going to vote for? So, I just use their words, let them tell us what they want to see happen to this country. Um, on your, sh on your page, uh, or your seat uh, this evening, there's a handout of our next meeting. It's on Sunday, June 5th. Normally we meet about once a month, but we have an opportunity to bring somebody to town that is incredibly brilliant. He works for the Center for Security Policy right now, kind of on loan, and he is in charge of refugee resettlement resistance around the country. And so he knows all what's going on, how insidious this plan is to invade Western civilization and plant refugees throughout our country, planting seeds. Who's behind it? All the globalists, all the socialists, all the internationalists, the communists, whatever, the UN. And he will be here to explain all that. Now, we're going to do event right again, but we can only hold 440 people. The announcement will go out on Thursday. And it's on Sunday, June 5th at 7 o'clock in the evening. So I realize there's graduation parties. We go to them in the afternoon. We couldn't pass it up. 
he's doing a, a five-state tour, going here, then to Michigan, then to Minnesota, then to Wisconsin, North Dakota. So, because the timing seemed pretty good, we have it right after Brigitte, so if you hear these two meetings, you're going to be like, wow, okay, what do we do? And then you're going to engage with us, hopefully. Okay, so that's uh, on your, yeah, everybody has that flyer, so. By the way, we normally charge $5, so we ask for a $5 donation at the door for our regular meetings to cover all the expenses. Tonight, Act for America's paying for that, so it was a free event for, for everybody here. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit about Brigitte. Brigitte Gabriel lost her childhood to militant Islam in 1975. She was 10 years old, living in southern Lebanon. When militant Muslims from throughout the Middle East poured into her country and declared jihad against the Lebanese Christians. Lebanon was the only Christian-influenced country in the Middle East, and the Lebanese Civil War was the first front in what has become the worldwide jihad of fundamentalist Islam against non-Muslim peoples. For seven years, Brigitte and her parents lived in an underground bomb shelter. She, was, she will explain more of that tonight. She is now the founder and president of Act for America. Ms. Gabriel is one of the leading national security experts in the world, providing information and analysis on the rise of Islamic terrorism. Ms. Gabriel lectures nationally and internationally about national security and current affairs. Her expertise is sought after by the world of business leaders. She's addressed the UN twice. The Australian Prime Minister, members of the British Parliament, House of Commons, members of the U.S. Congress, the Pentagon, Joint Forces Staff College, U.S. Special Operations Command, U.S. Asymmetric Warfare Group, the FBI, and many others. Quite frankly, she ought to go down to the Oval Office and have a talk. <laughs> In addition, Ms. Gabriel is a regular guest analyst on Fox News Channel, CNN, MSNBC, probably not lately, and various radio stations daily across America. She serves on the board of advisors of the Intelligence Summit. Ms. Gabriel is author of two New York Times bestsellers, Because They Hate and They Must Be Stopped. We have the, the second one here tonight, They Must Be Stopped. Ms. Gabriel is named one of the top 50 most prominent speakers in America. She speaks Arabic, French, English, and Hebrew. Right now, we're going to watch a short video about Act for America. You would kill those uh, lights up there? Thank you. Greg? We talk about all the changes in our country. There comes a point at which we have to say, we're going to make sure that the enemy does not conquer us from within. Islamic ideology, the threat that it poses here to us and our country. It's something that every American that's patriotic should be aware of. But are you wanting to do something about it? Are you just emailing? Are you just talking about it in your Sunday school classes? America is the greatest nation on earth. This is a nation built for the people, by the people. We have a responsibility. You are standing at the crossroads of history. Act for America today is truly a conference that's trying to educate the community. It's an opportunity for us to hear great speakers. It's an opportunity for us to get great information. Act for America is, is really about giving people the, the tools and the resources to know what the enemy is, know what uh, we're up against. We're going to Capitol Hill and meet with our uh, legislators, senators, your legislative briefing. My reasons for coming here is that I meet congressmen up on Capitol Hill. I hope to just let them see my face and know that I am a voice and I'm an activist. Acts for America has passed 42 bills in 22 states to protect America. What can we do? What can we do as law-abiding citizens? You have a heavy charge, we all do. It starts here with the Special Forces. Don't take lightly what you are doing. I can share what I learned, but it's not the same as being here. The whole atmosphere is electric. If you're down, you'll be pulled up again, and that's what's so great about this conference. This organization is about the idea that it's okay to be who you are as long as you do not compromise the rights and freedoms of others. And it empowers us to go back to our own states and take action. We represent other people too. And so it's important to convey that message how to cover our congressmen in. We need to be networked. We need to be active. We need to be vocal. The honor today is actually mine to work with and meet with amazing people. 
patriots like you. I was able to bring together patriots who love this country as much as I do, who travel across the country to make sure that we preserve our nation the way we got it from them and the way we're going to hand it to our future generations. Home of the brave. That's what we are. Land of the free. Those words mean something when you sing that in the national anthem. It means you need to get involved with this kind of activity. Floodlights, please. All the light. There you go. Let's give a warm Northeast Ohio welcome to Brigitte Gabriel. That's my specialty. That's what Act for America is all about. Protecting the United States of America, protecting our values, protecting our freedoms and everything we stand for. The national security issue is an American issue. It's not a Republican issue. It's not a Democratic issue. It's not a Libertarian issue. It's an American issue. America has been attacked under different administrations by radical Islam since 1979, regardless whether we had a Republican or a Democrat in the White House. America was attacked the first time under the Carter administration, a Democrat with the hostages in Iran. America was attacked again under the Ronald Reagan administration in 1983 with the bombings of the Marines in Lebanon. He was a Republican. America was attacked again under George Bush senior administration. America was attacked again under the Clinton administration, a Democrat with the bombings of the World Trade Center the first time in 1993. It was also under President Clinton that the Taliban trained 10,000 Al-Qaeda members in Afghanistan. Now these people were not being trained for entertainment. They were being trained to attack the United States of America. At that time, George Bush Jr. and Dick Cheney were not even a blurb on the political American landscape. And then, of course, America was attacked again under George Bush Jr. in 2001. And people thought, if we just get rid of George Bush and elect President Obama, 
All our sins are going to be forgiven. The whole world is going to come together and sing Kumbaya. But obviously that did not happen. Because two days after President Obama became president, Al-Qaeda issued a press release saying, we continue our jihad against the United States regardless of who lives in the White House. And since President Obama became president in the first four years of his administration, we have arrested on American soil 226 homegrown terrorists, 186 of them were Muslims. We have a problem in our country when a faith-based group that accounts for less than 2% of the American population is responsible for over 80% of terrorist plots against the United States. And this is a fact that's not an opinion. And that's only in the first four years of his administration. That doesn't count. That's before ISIS started. That doesn't count what we are dealing with today, that we can barely keep up with the numbers. As you can tell, I'm very passionate about the national security issue because it has affected my life personally. And I know a lot of you here tonight who came to this meeting because you heard me give an interview on the radio talking about national security and terrorism who may not know my background. So I'm going to share with you five minutes as to where this fire within comes from. I was born and raised in Lebanon, which used to be the only majority Christian country in the Middle East. We were open-minded, we were fair, we were tolerant, we were multicultural, we prided ourselves in our multiculturalism. We had open border policy, we welcomed everyone into our country because we wanted to share with them the westernization which we had created in the heart of the Middle East. Muslims sent their children to study in our universities because we had built the best universities in the Middle East. They graduated and worked in our economy because we had built the best economy in the Middle East even though we did not have any oil. <laughs> Beirut became known as Paris of the Middle East, the banking capital of the Middle East. National Geographic magazine in 1965 had on its front cover Lebanon, Eden of the Middle East. Unfortunately, all that began to change as the Muslims became the majority and the Christians became the minority. My 9-11 happened to me in 1975 when radical Islamists blew up my home, bringing it down, burying me under the rubble wounded as they shouted Allahu Akbar. I ended up in a hospital for two and a half months. And as I laid in a hospital bed hooked up to IVs in both arms, I would ask my father, why did they do this to us? And my father would tell me, because we are Christians, the Muslims consider us infidels, and they want to kill us. So I learned since I was a 10-year-old little girl that I am wanted dead simply because I was born into the Christian faith and lived in a Christian town. I ended up leaving the hospital and coming back home, but my home was no longer the home I left. I ended up living in a bomb shelter underground in an 8 by 10 room without electricity, without water, and with very little food. To get some food, we would crawl out under the bombs and we would dig out dandelions and different vegetation that grew around our bomb shelter because it was the only greenery we had to eat. To get some water, we would crawl under sniper's bullets to a nearby spring. And every time, before we left our bomb shelter, we would say our last goodbyes because we did not know if we're going to come back alive or dead just to get a drink of water because we were surrounded by snipers shooting at us. This became my existence. And in the beginning of the war, we thought America is going to come save the Christians. My father would say, all the big Christian countries are going to come to Lebanon and save the Christians and see what's happening to the Christians. Because that's when the massacres happened. And we were hearing stories about what was happening in Beirut and all the killings that were taking place, but the world forgot about us. The Muslims used to walk into a bomb shelter in a Christian town. They used to surround the Christian towns, walk into a bomb shelter, find a mother and a father hiding with a little baby in a bomb shelter. They would take the baby, tie one leg of the baby to the mother and another one to the father and pull the parents apart, spreading the child in half. 
They used to walk into our churches, urinate and defecate on the altar, destroy our churches, and use the Bible as toilet paper. They used to surround Christian cities and crucify men. One of the most famous massacres in Lebanon was the massacre of the Moor, where they would go in, the Christians hid in the churches, they thought they would be safe. Where the Muslims went in and literally crucified Christians. People hear about ISIS today and they think, this is new. This is a new phenomenon, killing the Christians. The last lady that worked for me, I hired her because she was mentally disturbed when I was in Lebanon. I hired her so I can take care of her. Because the Islamists walked into her bomb shelter, they took her only child, 16 years old, tied him on her lap, held the knife to her hand, and made her slit her own son's throat, and then raped her two daughters in front of her. That's the news that was seldom reported in Western media because all the media was located in West Beirut, the area that the Palestinians had by Yasser Arafat controlled. And everybody ignored what was happening to the Christians. We knew what our faith was going to be. And my father said, well, the big Christian cities, the big Christian countries are hearing about what's happening in Lebanon. France is going to come. Britain is going to come. Australia is going to come save the Christians. America is going to come save the Christians. But the world forgot about us. I ended up living in that bomb shelter for seven years of my life, from the age of 10 till the age of 17, fighting to survive, robbed of my youth. I remember three years into our ordeal, one of our Christian militia friends stopped by and he said, Brigitte, we heard a lot of chatter on the radio and I just want you to know that we know we're going to be attacked tonight. And he said, if I don't see you tomorrow, I wish you a merciful death. And he left. And I remember at the age of 13 years old, putting on my Sunday best, my Easter dress because I wanted to look pretty when I am dead, knowing that when they come to slaughter me, there would be no one to bury me. And I remember begging my mother, I don't want to die, please, I don't want to die, as she combed my long black hair down to my hips and tied a white ribbon in my hair. And there was nothing my mother could say to me. And we sat in the corner of our bomb shelter, and my father started reading from Psalms, I shall walk into the valley of death and fear no evil, for thou art with me. And my parents said to me, we will create a distraction if they come to slaughter us tonight. We just want you to run towards Israel and don't look back. Never look back. We lived a long life. You see, we lived five kilometers from the Israeli border. Thank God I did not have to make that decision that night. Because that's the night when Israel came in physically into Lebanon and established the security zone and set up artillery bases around our towns to stop the Islamic radicals from calling and the Palestinians from coming in and slaughtering us. And this is how we lived for another five years in that bomb shelter until 1982, when Israel came in physically into <coughs> Lebanon and working with the Christians invaded Lebanon, working with the Christians, trying to help the Christians take back their democracy and kick out the radical Islamic element that had taken control of the country at that time. Can I ask you kindly to turn that light off? Thank you so much. Yes, the phone, the camera that you're holding. Thank you very much. Very distracting. Thank you. It's okay. Because by the time Israel came into Lebanon in 1982, we had 11 Islamic terrorist organizations operating out of Lebanon at that time. And this is how Israel came in, and that's how we came out of our bomb shelter and back to rebuilding our lives. I ended up moving to Israel in 1984 and becoming a news anchor for World News in the Middle East, covering world events and reporting on world events. And I worked as a news anchor from 1984 to 1989. And that's when we started seeing a rise of terrorist activities around the globe and terrorist attacks. And as I read the news night after night, I started realizing that there was a pattern developing. The name of the perpetrators, no matter where the terrorist activity took place, no matter on what continent, the name of the perpetrators were always Muslims. Ahmed, Muhammad, Hussein, Ali. The name of the victims were always Westerners, Christians and Jews, 
Terry Wade, Terry Anderson, Colonel Hickens, the Akini Lauro, the TWA flight, the Pan Am flight, and I can go on and on. As a matter of fact, in my first book, titled Because They Hate, I list pages upon pages of all the attacks that the Islamists perpetrated against the West and against America, where America hit the snooze button and went back to sleep. And I started realizing that what I used to think was a regional problem between a majority Muslim Middle East trying to either kill or expel the minority Christians and Jews had become a worldwide problem. But the world was not paying attention. The world was not connecting the dots. And isn't this exactly what the 9-11 Commission report said to us? We lacked imagination. It's not that we did not know that the terrorists want to attack the United States. It's not that we did not know that Al-Qaeda wants to attack the United States. After all, they attacked us the first time in 1993 with the bombings of the World Trade Center. They attacked the Kubar Towers in 1995. They attacked our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1997. They attacked the USS Cole in 2000. And then they were so sure, so safe, in our apathy, in our ignorance, in our lack of interest, that they came back and re-attacked the World Trade Center the second time in 2001. And this time brought the buildings down and killed almost 3,000 Americans. It's not that we did not know what they wanted to do to us. After all, we have never been faced with an enemy that tells us exactly why they hate us, how much they hate us, how they want to kill us, why they want to kill us. They not only tell us about it, they issue press releases about it, they write about it on the internet, they even record a video press release and mail it to Al Jazeera, they don't mail it by courier, to air worldwide to tell us how much they hate us. And under all administrations since 2001, every single one of them buried their head in the sand and none of them wanted to discuss the problem, nor the ideology, or what is driving them. And it all started with President Bush. I'm an equal opportunity offender here because the national security issue is an American issue. It's not a Republican issue, it's not a Democratic issue. President Bush came out immediately saying, Islam is a religion of peace. Everybody, all of our elected officials, were bending backward and forward, tying themselves up like a pretzel, trying to run through the first red light to get to the nearest mosque to tell the Muslim, it's not your fault, you have nothing to do with this. Islam has nothing to do with it. Instead of calling the Muslim community on the carpet and saying, how can we have 19 hijackers that came out of your community from all over the United States and none of you came forward and said anything. And don't tell me these 19 people just dropped from the sky. Nobody, nobody wanted to discuss the ideology. They told us it was Al-Qaeda's problem. Once we get rid of Al-Qaeda, everything's going to be fine. It's only Al-Qaeda. They ignored all other terrorists across the globe. Al-Qaeda was our problem. Well now, when you look at the, now we have ISIS, obviously. And now when you look, now all you hear about on television is ISIS, ISIS, ISIS. When was the last time you heard anything about Al-Qaeda? Unless Al-Qaeda said something to ISIS and then we reported. <laughs> like what happened this week. But everything now, the talk du jour is ISIS. That's our problem. But nobody is talking about the ideology that it's bonding all terrorists across the globe. When you look at what's bonding them all together, and you start looking at terrorist organizations across the globe, you start realizing whether it's Boko Haram in Nigeria, whether it's Al-Shabaab in Somalia, whether it's Ashkar al-Taibi in India, Ansar al-Sharia in Libya, ISIS in Iraq al-Sham, Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Al-Akhwan al-Muslimun in Egypt, it doesn't matter what name they go by. What brings them all together is the ideology. Whether they are black, it transcends all color. I mean, these organizations don't even speak the same language. Boko Haram in Nigeria is black. They don't speak Arabic. Al-Shabaab in Somalia, Lashkar Taibi in India, they don't speak Arabic, they're Indians. 
when you start looking at this and you start thinking, how can our government and our leadership misrepresent the truth for us or lie to us for so long? But that's the reality we are dealing with. And it's about time we discuss the ideology and what is driving them. And in order for you to understand this ideology that everybody talks about but nobody really wants to talk about, so I'm going to lay